at least right now, there's no functional uh, JavaScript implementation of a client. Okay. Uh, so if we press the preview here, then it will run through. And so what happens is we're making a reservation. And so uh, we put in 200 for gas. The sender is Alice. And uh, for the data, we have the first item is key name, and the second is val1. Um, and so what happens is it sees, uh, so the, the, the data size is equal to two. Um, so we can actually step back here with step execution. So it goes on to this condition, and it checks for this contract storage. Now, it currently does not have a value. So it's going to proceed on line three here, where it sets the contract storage value, and then it finally returns, um, and it returns a successful state. Now, if we go on to one of these tests that is trying to make a reservation uh, where there's already a reservation, so in this case, for um, the, the key key name, it already has a value, then we'll see that if we step back um, to here, um, it does not pass this condition, so it actually goes on on line five to this else statement, and then it returns that uh, failure state. Uh, so you could say effectively you built a full sort of debugging environment for a contract. Uh, yeah. Line by line. Yeah, that's right, and it's still very kind of basic, um, and the idea is to continue adding more functionality. Um, so just to give a better idea of some of the other things we can do, this is uh, insufficiency. Um, let's add a getter. So for this one, we're not going to try to set anything. All we're going to do is just get uh, the current contract storage. And the way we do this is instead of passing in two items, we only pass in one item, which would be the key name that we're trying to get. Um, so for this one, let's just put in 50 gas. Uh, the sender can be Alice. And for the data, we just want key name. And then if we press preview, then we're going to walk through it. Ah. So it actually didn't have enough gas. Let's put in five more. And then so it stopped here where it returns this value. Um, and it actually currently does not say what the, the value is, um, but it's returning whatever that value is. Now, if we wanted to test that it would return a certain value, then what we need to do here for the contract storage is for this key name, put uh, key name. And then we can put any kind of value we want for the, uh, the value. So this value could be like food bar. Um, so then when this returns um, on line eight, it will return the value of food bar. Um, now one thing about this contract storage that it does not really accommodate is the idea of permissions where mm -hmm. if let's say you've already set a value and you want to be able to update that value, it doesn't currently allow you to do that. Okay. Um, so if we have time, maybe we can um, go ahead and modify this contract a bit so it allows for that. I think that would be pretty cool. Um, but can you tell us a little bit more about sort of saving contracts and so it looks like I can actually save this or? Sure, yeah, so. In you, my own version. Yeah, so um, the idea is that there's different settings. Um, so you have read-only mode, mm -hmm. and that's where other people can see the contract, but they can't edit and save it. Because okay. you wouldn't want them to make changes um, in all cases. But if you want, you can have a public contract that everyone can read it, right? Okay. Um, so I could just go ahead and make a contract and send it out to friends, and if they have ideas, they can go ahead and modify it. Cool. And then finally, there's a private mode, and this means that it won't show up in search, and the only way that somebody can access it is if they already know this, um, this URL, this ID. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So let's go ahead. We already saved it. Let's go ahead and make a copy. Uh, it looks like they're building the, the GitHub of Ethereum or something. Uh, yeah, that's sort of the idea. Um, I mean, in, uh, of course, GitHub has a lot of um, things like history and merging and so forth. I think history would be a really great feature for this tool, um, but right now it doesn't feature anything like that. Um, so if we wanted to go ahead and modify this to, um, to also be able to have some kind of permissions so that somebody who's already edited um, a, a value can update it, the first thing that we're going to have to track is when somebody successfully updates, um, who updated that, uh, uh, that that key. So we're going to have to sort of come up with a new namespace here. Um, so let's see. 
So this could be setting the value for contract storage. And then we could even do something like this. And we're sure we're going to secure this thing with a second closing bracket. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then we can just put in the message sender. So what we're doing is formatting the key. And so the key consists of um, the uh, the key that's being passed in underscore and then the address of the sender. Um, or actually, we actually don't need to do this. We can just do uh, admin. And then the value would be the message sender. Uh -huh. And let's see. Okay, just to make this a little bit better. Okay. So sorry for not saying up on um on Serpent, but uh, is this automatically going to create a Serpent allows you to create a whatever numerical value of the string to? For the storage, or oh, I see. Yeah. So what we'd probably want to do is, um, well, in this case, the data is supposed to be passed in as a string, mm -hmm. so it's not doing any type conversion. So you could have a scenario where someone passes an integer and this would fail. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, we can go ahead and test this out, where instead of key name being a string, our uh, will be an integer here. Um, yeah, it is. Oh, okay. I see. So it's reporting the syntax error. Um, okay, well, so, but the idea is that we basically want to be able to track um, who the uh, who created this entry, and then right. um, if somebody else is trying to edit it, don't allow them to, and if mm -hmm. somebody's trying to update a, a value that they already set, then they can go ahead and do that. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, so it's still, you know, it has a couple of bugs that we're still ironing out, but it's um, it's pretty exciting to get some early feedback and to hopefully make it easier for people to develop smart contracts. Cool. So, you know, where where else do you see this evolving? What sort of things do you think will add in or something maybe related to the JavaScript bindings that are happening in? Oh, uh, well, yeah. So um, the, the proof of concept five, POC five features such such as the uh, custom interfaces for contracts is pretty interesting. Um, so there's really, going forward, there's going to be two different components for a contract. And one component is like the serpent code like we have here, or we have here. Um, and the other component is the interface that the user sees. Mm -hmm. um, so for currency, that might be something where they can, uh, there's a form where they can look up the current that balance and send money to other people or mm -hmm. send funds to other people. Um, so I would certainly be interested in, in um, enhancing this tool with the ability to set up a custom interface, for instance. Well, it looks like you are already well on the way, James, and um, I applaud you for your efforts. So, um, thanks. Uh, any final words? Uh, yeah, if, if you have any feedback or suggestions for features, or if you're interested in uh, contributing to the project, please feel free to get in touch. My email is james at mintchop.com. And um, on a similar note, uh, Joris and myself do accept tips. You can see where you can send them uh, at the end of this video. Thank you.